Hey y'all, my name is Celeste. I'm a therapist from Boston. I have an amazing episode lined up for you. Don't forget, if you want to catch the visuals, I stream my podcast live, yes, live in front of a live audience on YouTube, Facebook, and Periscope. All you got to do is search Celeste the Therapist and you can find me. I'm always talking to somebody that's doing something to empower the lives of others. Uh, So check out this story. Let me know what you think. If you enjoy my amazing guest, make sure you give her a follow. If you want to support me, share this episode with somebody that you love. You can also rate me on Apple Podcasts. That will help boost my podcast up on the mental health chart. Uh, and you can also follow me on all social media platforms. You can support me on Patreon, uh, or you can just go to my website to learn more about me, celestetherapist.com. Let's get into this amazing episode. But one of the main things that I do have qualms with is that we embody our emotions in the English language. So in, so what we always say is, I am sad, I am depressed, I am angry, whereas every other language that I know and that I've Google translated because I got obsessed with this idea one day. <laughs> Every other language will say, I feel. You say, I feel oh my God, sad. Seriously? Yes. Yeah. Wow. Isn't that crazy? And that's what I want to, I, I want to make sure everyone realizes it's okay to feel, right? It's okay to feel sad, depressed, angry, frustrated, anxious. Like it's okay to feel whatever you feel. But as long as we're not embodying that and make telling our bodies and our mind that that's permanent. When we say I am, that makes it permanent. When we say I feel, it makes it temporary. So just being mindful of the words that we then think and say. 365 days, but I treat every day like it's my last. I'm only concerned with building on the future because I can't change my past. Positive vibes for positive lives. She just giving you that truth and shifting your mind. It's more mental than you realize. It's up to you to take control, cause this world is cold. And negativity gon' take its toll. Now we've been told any day could be your last. I'm embracing every moment and I cherish every laugh. Every smile, every hug, every kiss, every touch. Every person in my life that I care about and love. But wait, maybe I'm getting too emotional. That's exactly what they say you ain't supposed to do. Suppress your feelings, never talk about your pain Can't appreciate the sun without acknowledging it rains, right? That's right So this a moment of clarity And make sure you always protect your energy You stay focused and your life gon' be lit And you are now rocking with Celeste the Therapist Let's go Hello How are you? Can you introduce yourself to the audience? Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much for having me, first of all. Um, But well, a little bit about me. So my name is Dr. Hanisha Patel, and I am a naturopathic doctor. And a lot of you probably don't even know what a naturopathic doctor is or what naturopathic medicine is, because it's really not that common. A naturopathic doctor essentially practices or we're trained in primary care, um, but in a more preventative sort of way. So the, the way that we're trained is we actually learn to try to treat the root cause of illness and disease and um, work through it by that. So naturopathic medicine itself is actually the combination of putting together the rigors of modern science with the ancient wisdom of nature and bringing it together for a more holistic perspective on medicine and a holistic perspective for each individual. So we're looking to treat the whole person instead of just specializing in certain different um, different organ systems or things like that. Of course, there's a time and a place for that, but we we kind of are like this, usually the center, and then we, we then will refer out as needed. But um, our training, just a really quick background in our training is it, we do have to go to four years of undergraduate. Um, I actually got my degree in pharmaceutical sciences at Ohio State, and then um, I had to do four more years at Bastyr University, which is a naturopathic medical school, two years, the first two years are very similar to conventional medical school where we learn about the basic sciences. And then the next two years are a little bit more clinical, um, but that's where we get into learning about different modalities like nutrition, um, herbal medicine, physical medicine, homeopathy, and also pharmaceuticals and surgery as well, or minor surgery. And so we get a very wide range of um, studies in in our practice and and we use all of those modalities in our practices as well and i'm no different from that so that's a little bit about what i do that's amazing you just helped me like really conceptualize what you do i love the fact that you bring in the alternative style yeah and i know prior to science being involved in alternative style that was the only style we had 
Right. Why do you think, and I, and, bef- and after this, I want to get into how you got into this, but why is it that you think uh, so much of our uh, country only looks at the science and not the holistic whole person? Yeah, definitely. So I will say, well, I will say for one, a lot of the indigenous practices actually are science-based. Um, it's just a different type of research that they were doing in, um, you know, before over, I think, you know, conventional research, this double blind controlled study that really only came about a little over a hundred years ago. So it's very new. Um, before that they were using all sorts of like long-term studies, um, long-term, um, or retrograde studies or um, studies where we would um, do more observational studies, right? Just like focusing and figuring out like, oh, like these people in this kind of like, who tend to have this type of skin type or these people who normally tend to have this type of body type, they tend to be more like this. So they tend to have more issues with these diseases. And that's like, that's the type of research that they were doing. And then there was a lot of research within like, it was a lot of trial and error, right? Like it was Mm -hmm. like, things like turmeric that we, we hear so much about today has been used for thousands and thousands of years before this because people realized the medicinal benefits of it, right? And so I will say that honestly, my personal opinion, based on what I know of history, because this is where history and science are so connected, politics and science clearly we're seeing with today is so connected um, and, and really, the the people in power can kind of shift the story and that's that's the reality of it and in in my personal opinion based on that um i i really think a lot of indigenous practices got suppressed because of racism Mm -hmm. and this is something that i feel like many people don't talk about but all of the traditional medicines are now considered complementary or alternative because it's as if anyone who practiced anything outside of Western medicine could not have been right. Right. (laughs) And that's, that's the way like we've been, it's been ingrained in us. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, But there have been, you know, indigenous practices all over the world, like indigenous American medicine, African medicine, um, Ayurvedic or ancient Indian medicine, Chinese medicine, all of these types of medicines. Like it's so fascinating when you get into it, you're like, Oh my God, they knew, they knew thousands of years ago and we're relearning now and we're, we're in a way discovering, but really we're not discovering, we're rediscovering. Mm -hmm. We're not discovering anything new. We're just rediscovering. And that is what it is. And so when I think about why it's been suppressed, that's what, that's where my answer always comes to. It's like, And they make it harder because a lot of the things that you would prescribe, insurance doesn't cover. And I did not learn about people like you until I had a client telling me about seeing someone like you. And Mm -hmm. and, uh, now I'm always talking to people about natural people that look at the holistic uh, side of the issue. Uh, And and it's a lot of people have found so much... uh, support from it. Uh, And speaking of the alternative methods, the reason why you even are in this field is because of your own struggle with autoimmune um, struggles. So can you talk to the audience about how you kind of stumbled on this path of your healing journey? Yeah, definitely. So I've actually had my own personal health issues since I was born. So I was born... um, with a lot of digestive issues. I was a, definitely a really colicky baby. And then around six months old, I had a, a hernia. And so I had to get a surgery done then. And um, and so, and my digestive issues obviously didn't go away with the surgery, right? Um, after that, I was, I was on more antibiotics, which actually affected my digestion even more. Um, and then I had asthma and allergies. And by the age of nine, I started experiencing chronic back pain. Um, but I started my cycle when I was around 12 years old and it was never normal. Uh, I never had a normal cycle until really about now, just like a few years ago. Um, and so until naturopathic medicine, a number of different health issues. And I would say the main things were like the pain that I was experiencing that back pain. Um, I also started experiencing some joint pain in college. Um, and, and then my digestive pain, like anytime I would eat, I would feel pain and it was super uncomfortable. 
How, I mean, being sick since, sick since you were a child, how, how do you think that affected your mental health going through all of these different issues? Yeah, I, you know, I, I grew up in a family where, I mean, also being from the Midwest, I think there's a combination of the culture. And then also with the right way my parents raised me, it was always like, kind of like suck it up, right? Like, you don't, you don't show that you feel pain, you know, it's it, we like that, that I'm, and that's something that I'm still working on is like, it's okay to feel right. Um, but and so a lot of that I had honestly just suppressed because I was like, I was like, oh, I mean, I'm in pain, but like, what am I going to do about it? And anytime I would reach out to doctors, because one of my big things, the reason why I was in so much digestive pain was because I was super constipated. Um, I don't know if this is TMI for your, for your listeners, no, but. It's fine. Let's talk about it. Just, I, yeah. Everybody's been constipated at some point in their life. <laughs> right. But I would have a bowel movement like maybe once a week. Damn. And. Yeah. And now I have a bowel movement every day, at least one. And, and I don't know how I dealt with it because anytime I'm a little constipated now, I'm like, Ooh, this is not fun. <laughs> I'm like, now it's like, a, yeah, you're supposed to move your blouse every day. Like, yeah, every you day you got to go every day. And if you're not like, there's the, like, that's what we need to address. Right. And so, yeah, that was, that was something that I dealt with for a long time. And then, it was honestly not until I discovered naturopathic medicine that I realized that I didn't have to deal with those because by the time I even discovered naturopathic medicine, I thought it was something that was just my normal, um, which is what I was told so often by conventional doctors was like, oh, maybe it's just your normal to have a bowel movement once a week. And I'm like, no, no. I'm like, oh, that is so not normal. <laughs> It's so not normal. Um, like, I don't know what else to tell you, lady. Like, <laughs> yeah, I'm like, we need to have more bowel movement. There's like a double sided story to my my journey because I actually went into naturopathic medical school thinking I wanted to support people with more alternative routes or more herbal medicine, nutrition, exercise, mindset, all of these things. But I didn't realize those things could help me which is, which is crazy. Like, I didn't think that it would help me and my issues, but it was at this point I had denied or like suppressed my issues anyway. I was like, oh, this is just my normal. So it was like a double-sided or story because I actually went into it because my degree was in pharmaceutical sciences. And as I learned about the medications and then the side effects of the medications and then the medications needed for those side effects, <laughs> Like, it's a vicious cycle. It's a vicious cycle, right? And I was like, this doesn't make sense. I would just sit in class and be like, I don't get it. Like, it doesn't make sense. And I'm so grateful that I'm so I'm I'm Indian American. And I so I was I was born in the US, but my parents, you know, Indian immigrants. And so a lot of times and we wouldn't feel well, they would give us like the turmeric lattes that have become so popular now. Like we would drink that all the time when we didn't feel well. And I remember it helping. And so I was like, you know what? Like, why don't I explore my own like like my ancestral medicine? And and that's a part of why I became so passionate about like getting back to our roots and understanding the ancestral connection between medicine and um, where we are today. And so that's where I went to India, learned a little bit more about Ayurvedic medicine. And I was like, and then I actually also traveled to Guatemala and learned about their traditional medicine. And from there, that was when I realized, I was like, okay, so, so there are other things that work. We yeah. just don't know about it, right? We're just not taught about it, probably just because the white, white man doesn't do it. And that's, and <laughs> just to be completely blunt, like that's like, that's where I had that realization and, yeah. and then continued my journey from there. Yeah. Um, I always say yeah. that, uh, you know, you at late at night, I'm going to answer your question, Crystal and Donald. Um, uh, and then I want to go into gut health, but yeah. I always listen to those commercials where they talk about, are you depressed? And they say like, well, take this. And then they name like 20 million side effects. But I wish there was a commercial that says, are you depressed? What are you doing? What are you eating? How are you sleeping? But I think about that and I know that no one's going to get paid no if we're well, paid. Right? right? They don't get paid if we're well. So sometimes there's a cycle where we stay sick because we're not educated about the things that we can do that's within our control to keep our mental status well, you know? 
Yeah, definitely. And that, and that I love that you brought that up too, because I was recently reading how we've increased um, the amount of antidepressants that we prescribe about 400 fold um, in the last 30 years. Mm. And right, like, isn't that crazy? And that's where people ages 12 and up. So starting at the age of 12, which is so young. And, um, and I'm like, are we addressing everything else before resorting to that? I don't, mm-hmm. I don't think antidepressants are always wrong. You know, right. I don't think they're always bad, right. but are we addressing everything else before resorting to that? And I don't think the answer is yes. I a hundred percent agree with you. And, uh, when people come to me, um, and I taught and I'm somebody that's not this person against medication, but I am against us doing what we can do first and let right. that be our kind of last thing that is within our control. Uh, but it's, you know, this is why I started the podcast and have people like you on, you know, to help give your expertise around, around this subject. Uh, Krista wants to know how does she find a doctor near her? Uh, she wants alternative holistic doctor in her life. Yeah, definitely. So you can search, um, there's a website, um, the, or the organization is called the Institute of Natural Medicine. Um, that's where you can search a doctor near you. Um, and a lot of doctors, including myself do see people virtually too. So, um, so if you can't necessarily find someone near you, I think the virtual, um, route is super helpful. Like I have some patients who like live in the country and so it's, it's hard to find a, a, a holistic practitioner who lives in the countryside, right? Um, you might find a few in the city, but that's, that's really it. So, so I think that's helpful there, but yeah, Institute of Natural Medicine is a great resource. Donna wants to know if you incorporate fasting in your regimens. Ooh, that is a great question. So um, I love talking about fasting. Fasting is something that again, like, I mean, I'm the type of person who always wants to bring it back to the history. I love talking about the history of medicine because it's something I'm super passionate about, but we've been doing this for thousands of years. We've been fasting for thousands of years and it has in numerous benefits. The only problem is today, the way we've kind of set up our lifestyle, it may not be ideal for every single person. So there are certain situations where I have seen and, and it depends. So like if, um, if someone has like lower blood sugar levels, normally fasting is probably not the right move for them right now. Um, I know I personally was trying to fast because I thought it was, you know, healthy. I thought it was good for me. Um, but at that time it was actually really bad for me, but now I'm at a point where I've been able to heal that side of my blood sugar and I am able to fast and I do it regularly. And so, so it kind of depends. And so that's why I definitely don't like that. Everyone just promotes fasting um, and just doing it all for everyone because it isn't for everyone. It's like, yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. It's not for everyone, but it can definitely be beneficial. I usually say, um, if you can at least try to keep two to four hours between meals uh, because that actually activates something called the MMC or the migrating motor complex in our gut. And that's what helps us like remove the toxins. I consider like in my mind, I see the MMC as like the vacuum that just goes through our gut and it's just like cleaning things up and it can only be activated with fasting for at least two hours. So that's one thing I usually just try to recommend in general though. I'm going to take these two questions and then we're going to go into gut health. I'm kind of afraid to go into gut health because I feel like I'm going to be uh, hit over the head about things I'm doing. But let's get these questions in because I'm doing this for the people. So I have to yeah. get my knowledge together. is power. <laughs> knowledge is power. And and I mean, this is the thing with the diet culture and all that stuff, too. Like I always say that we need to give ourselves grace throughout the process. Okay. Yeah. Uh, how can we support natural medicine for those navigating substance use disorder? Do you mean like how can we use natural medicine to support those with substance use disorder? Yeah, that the- um, I'll let her okay. answer. Um, but you know, obviously, with substance abuse disorder, the, it's it's pretty challenging. And I think um, just to kind of answer it from a chem- uh, you know physiological chemical side of it, uh, when people are trying to get off of substances and they've been using it at high levels it's going to be hard to uh, just go cold turkey naturally uh, because their body can go into shock. Uh, She says, yeah, that's what she's asking. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's exactly what you said that we, we definitely want to work with a few different providers. Usually when it comes to substance abuse, um, 
I mean, honestly, a lot of things, I, I rarely work alone. Um, I help patients who are on antidepressants get off of antidepressants, but I always work with their psychiatrist as well um, and their therapist and we like have conversations. And that's what I think really is the future of medicine and what I, I try to embody. But yeah, that's the same thing with substance use disorders. There are ways that in, in terms of natural medicine, there are a lot of nutrients uh, that get depleted with substance abuse. And so the way that we can support as naturopathic physicians is by helping to replete those nutrients. And then um, potentially, again, it depends, potentially recommending some herbal medicine that can be supportive, but there could also be interactions with those medications. So we have to be very mindful. All right, I'm gonna take. I keep saying that, but I never had so many questions coming at one time. Uh, what did your diet look like? And then, uh, should I drink raw apple cider vinegar on a daily basis? Uh, and everybody's diet looks different, Crystal. We all can't look like Dr. Anisha. Yeah, no, and and that's exactly it. So that's exactly what I was going to say. Is that um, every single person's diet is different, and even with pretty much every patient of mine, I do recommend different diets. And so I use, um, whenever I'm recommending for other, for my patients, I use a combination of the blood type diet. I use a, com a little bit of the Ayurvedic medicine model and depending on the, the diet. so the blood type diet, Dr. Diamato, he formulated this blood type diet, which was based off of actually Japanese indigenous medicine. And, um, and so based off of that, he determined that there are certain blood types that do better with certain, certain types of diets. Um, yeah, it's super fascinating. And it's I I think I got into it more because of the history behind it. And like, so you get into like, okay, people with like, let's say O positive blood type or O blood type, they tend to be so the O blood type was the original blood type that humans I'm had. Original? So the first you're <laughs> original. And, yeah. And so like, so that's like the OG blood type, right? The <laughs> oh my God, you just made my day. Thank you. All my O positive people. <laughs> there you go. And so, um, so, but, but with that comes, uh, comes the diet, right? Like what's an optimal diet for someone who's O positive, um, that is usually what our paleolithic ancestors ate, right? So we go back to the original diet then too. Um, and so that's not really having like farm, like agriculture wasn't a thing, you know, agriculture came up only about like 20,000 years ago, technically. But if we go into like areas, so Africa was where we all originated. And so that's where that blood type originated. But if we like go on to like Asia, the Middle East, we'll see more people with like B blood type. And then eventually a mutation happened of the A and then eventually the AB blood type. And so- um, well, AB is the last, AB is y'all the last. <laughs> <laughs> y'all are <they're> newbies. <laughs> That's why we can give blood to everybody because we're the OGs. That's exactly. So yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah, so it's fascinating whenever you get into all that. Um, but I also use Ayurvedic medicine um, or or the ancient Indian medicine to figure out. And I also use the labs that I get. And so like modern science-based nutrition as well. So I, I kind of use a combination, putting it together, figuring out what's going to be ideal. So he's saying, yeah, vegan. So is it the, the it was a vegan lifestyle at first? No, or? it wasn't oh, actually. Okay. <laughs> um, so it's like more of the paleo, like for the O blood type. Again, the vegan diet might be ideal for you, um, but, um, and, and it might not correlate with that, with your blood type, you know, so it, it just, it also depends on where you are in your life too. Um, so that's where I see, I hear a lot of people feel better with the vegan diet. Usually that's because most people weren't eating that many vegetables at all. Um, <laughs> so finally they're eating some veggies and so they're feeling better, right? And um, and so that's where they're feeling better. But usually the paleo, paleolithic ancestors, they were having a lot of vegetables, some fruit, and then they were actually eating meat, but more wild meat. So usually I, what I recommend is avoiding um, the more farm factory farm meats. So like, like beef and pork and chicken, which are probably like the things that most people eat most of. <laughs> what else is there? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, and that's kind of where I usually, so I'm not O blood type. I'm the B positive blood type, oh, but so sorry. I, 
<laughs> well, my the B positive blood type actually came from the Mongols, so I thought that was a pretty cool story oh, okay. as well. <laughs> um, and um, so we, yeah, so we were second. We were second, and um, but that's why we are closely related to the O, where we have a similar type of diet. Um, but yeah, so I usually eat in terms of my meat. I will have more turkey, lamb, goat, bison, just wilder meat in general. All right. And then the last question, uh, should I drink raw apple cider vinegar on a daily basis? Yeah, that's a great, que great question because I feel like this has become super popular. And honestly, I have found it to be very helpful for most people. Um, and I don't think there's very many like negative side effects to it. So I, I would say go for it. Um, I think it's a great way to just work on um balancing out your stomach acid so yeah I, I would say go for it um but you know of course every single person's different so i don't you know i can't say how you'll react to it but you but can try it out it balances out our stomach acids right yeah okay now speaking of stomach stuff let's get into <laughs> yeah. the, this gut let's get into the gut yes. and figure out what's going on with the gut <laughs> Let's do it. Uh, so one of the things that a lot of people I've heard talk about is this correlation with the gut, brain, mental health. Um, talk to people a little bit about uh, that kind of connection that you've seen. Yeah, definitely. So, um, so yeah, I think this has become a very commonly said thing, the gut brain connection and, um, and I don't think people talk about the gut mental health connection as much. Um, but what I want to make clear is that your brain health affects your mental health and your gut health affects your brain health, which then therefore also affects your mental health, right? So they're all, it's all connected and almost every, everything in our body is connected. So if our hormones are out of balance, then it's, it could be associated with our gut. And, um, and so that's just something that I feel like we've lost, but we're starting to come back to, like, we're starting to come back to it now that everything is connected. And so with the gut brain connection, I think it's important to start with what is the gut and then what is the brain? <laughs> and so <laughs> the gut, what I don't think most people realize is includes all of the organs in our digestive system, starting from our oral cavity. So starting from our mouth, all the way I, down I to our anus. To, I did not know that. I thought the gut was just my stomach. <laughs> Right. No, it goes far beyond that. So it's literally everything from here in our mouth all the way down to our anus. And so that's including our colon, our liver, um, our pancreas, our stomach, of course, our small intestine, um, all of these organs that are in our digestive system, the esophagus, where so that's where whenever if anyone experiences symptoms like heartburn, bloating, constipation, diarrhea, reflux, nausea, vomiting, all of that's associated with your gut. Um, and so, so that's, that's the gut, but what, how it is then connected to the brain, which is obviously the brain is the organ that controls everything. It tells us, it's telling me to make all these hand movements right now, which I, <laughs> I know I probably do way too much. Um, but, but but that's that's what our brain is doing it helps and you know it gives us a sense of smell taste touch all of these things but then also gives us the the motor control where we make voluntary movements we make voluntary decisions things like that right so it controls what we we don't think about all the time like breathing but then it also controls things that we can focus on and change right like working out or whatever and so with that connection then there actually is a physical connection between the gut and the brain. And that is via the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve is something that is connected directly from our brain to every single one of those organs that I just mentioned in our gut. And so is it is fascinating. I love talking about the vagus nerve because it's it's just so cool. <laughs> but and uh, and we'll talk about I actually I love talking about ways to activate the vagus nerve. So we'll talk about that in a second. But that's one way that it's connected. And I want to remind everyone that it's bidirectional. So that that means that what we put into our gut, so that's of course the foods and whatever affects our gut, so movement or lack of movement, all of that can affect our gut. It's actually really fascinating because there's studies that show that the gut and any sort of exercise can actually alter the gut microbiota. Um, so if we're exercising, then we can actually optimize our gut microbiome just by exercising. And um, 
I feel like that's something people don't think about. You just think about food, gut, but exercise Sorry, also I'm affects I'm just thinking that. about my audience because they may know what this is. What, what's the microbiota? Yeah. So the gut microbiome is this ecosystem of bacteria, uh, fungi, viruses, and maybe even some parasites that and, and we're finding that some, I, I don't want to scare people with parasites because we're finding that some might actually be supportive and, you know, um, commensal, which means that we work in unison with them. And that's the same thing with the bacteria, fungi, and viruses too. So in terms of the bacteria, we have over 10 trillion bacteria in our gut um, alone and, or sorry, 10 trillion bacteria in general. And that's about 100 to 1,000 times more than we have human cells. So, so that's how much like, yeah, so there's like, people will ask the question, like, are we really bacteria or are we human? <laughs> <laughs> we don't really know. <laughs> but um, these, these bacteria will the way that it it can also affect our brain, whatever is happening with our bacteria is because these bacteria can create um, some end products called postbiotics. So we hear a lot about probiotics, but these bacteria will create postbiotics, which are essentially chemical messengers that can go into your bloodstream. And so these messengers can go into your bloodstream and then send signals to any organ system. And that's one of them could be the brain. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's how your gut microbiome can affect your brain. Mm -hmm. And what we want is because, like I said, we have great bacteria in our body because that's how we stay alive. But when we don't. So this is kind of I don't know. Like, I'm going to give you a little analogy and this is um, simplifying it so much. But the way I think about it. Yeah, we all do. I, I mean, I feel like I learned better this way too. And so like, this is the way I learned it. And this is the way I essentially teach it too. But, um, but yeah, I think of it as like, think about, you know, the antagonist versus the protagonist, right? If we're at war with one another, um, there's the good guys and the bad guys. And with the, what, whatever we do with our diet, with our lifestyle, um, with, our mindset with our, our, our lack of or, or type of movement, um, all of these things, sleep, all of these things can alter the gut microbiome. And so if we're eating nourishing foods, if we're sleeping well, if we have a positive, optimistic mindset, um, if we're or exercising regularly, if we're doing all these things, we're arming the good guys, right? Mm -hmm. So we're just giving them the, the arm right? Like we're armor, arming the good guys and depriving or starving the bad guys. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what we're doing. And that, but if we do the exact opposite, right? So eating, you know, McDonald's all the time or, um, you know, sitting on your couch all day, never actually walking or moving or doing anything like that, having negative thoughts that can actually, that's what arms the bad guys, which of course mm -hmm. we don't want, but those bad guys can then kill off some of the good guys. And that's where a lot of the gut issues and kind of overall health issues really start. Yeah. And that's, um, and I think there's no way to, uh, cause, because the gut stuff that goes on, uh, for instance, a lot of my clients who have <clears throat> had some constipation issues, uh, or some migraine issues. And then I started talking, I'm not a neuropathic doctor, but I understand how everything works. Yeah. And I was able to show them around the times of high stress, constipation comes in, it's activated, right? Or uh, the migraines is usually around stressful events, right? The more I speak right. to them, the more I start to realize mm -hmm. there's this correlation. Mm -hmm. And then people actually start to see it. But usually, at, you know, when they go to the doctor, it's usually um, thinking more about what they can take um, for the, the constipation or what they can take for the migraine uh, and not mm -hmm. really going deeper to the issue. And a lot of times I've noticed that it's very much stress related and it's going on around what's happening in their environment. Right, definitely. And stress can alter your gut microbiome so much and mm -hmm. so quickly. And so it's actually fascinating. There's a study where they found um, patients with ulcerative colitis, how it would actually trigger, the ulcerative colitis would actually trigger anxiety and, um, and that stress response would be greater. And what they did, what they did to test that 
connection was they actually induced ulcerative colitis in rats um, then to see if if that would also trigger anxiety. And it did. It did. And and then they also found the other way around where um, patients with anxiety were more likely to have ulcerative colitis flares. So clearly showing that connection. And I know so many patients who like, they have an anxiety attack or feeling like feeling super anxious, they get nauseous, right? Like it's, that's your gut. That's your gut that's affected directly. And so yeah, so that's why I like talking about the bi-directional effect because mm-hmm. our mindset affects our gut, our gut affects our mind. And if somebody's listening to this thinking about how do I start to, you know, right now take care of my uh, gut health, how do I start this process? Uh, because I, I really believe we can like work with what we have and um, and empower ourselves in that way. So what would you say to somebody like that? Yeah, for sure. Well, yeah, there, there is really so much that we can do. And um, I, I really like to focus on the foundations first, right? So making sure, of course, starting with like nutrition, which is something that we, I feel like we all inherently know, but we're kind of afraid to, <laughs> to talk about. Um, but trying to just, I, I don't really usually recommend too much. Like, I don't, I don't, agree with diet culture. I I don't, I don't promote it. I don't condone it. Um, so I just usually recommend just incorporating more vegetables into your diet. Um, I, I personally, at this point, I try to get at least seven to nine cups of vegetables a day in my diet. Um, and that is ideal. And the vegetables are going to arm the good guys. Exactly. Exactly. And, and they have fiber, right? So, um, the daily recommended amount of fiber um, is honestly despicable <laughs> because it's only about 20 grams and that doesn't even allow you to have a proper bowel movement every day. So um, I usually recommend trying to get at least 35 grams if that's something. And these are things that I'm always like, okay, count in the beginning, but then whenever you get the hang of it, you know, just like, just eat the food, right? Just don't, don't let it consume your life. But like count, maybe like in the beginning when you're trying to learn and figure out, you can be like, okay, like how much fiber am I getting now? And then, um, but yeah, like I said, try to get at least 35 grams. Our ancestors, our Paleolithic ancestors, were actually getting about hundred grams a day of fiber. So it was crapping all day. Yeah, they were. And then they were also moving all day too. And so that's, that's the next step, right? Making sure you're getting some physical activity, um, one thing that I always say is I really don't care what you do <laughs> as long as you move. Um, so whether it's, uh, you know, whether it's going on a run or walking or, um, doing yoga or Pilates bar, any of these things. And, you know, it's the one beautiful thing that's come out of, uh, COVID I think is that there are so many free online resources now mm-hmm. that, um, that are, that are amazing. Like there's so many amazing people out there. And I I mean, I use them, um, for my own personal exercise habits. Um, but yeah, just getting some, some sort of movement in is, I mean, and I think we're finding even more the connection between exercise and mental health too. And, um, and that's, that's super important. And then how does sleep play a role in it? I know uh, a lot of people uh, may not understand uh, the value in sleep. And, and when three things I tell people, and I'm always incorporating this in my talks of people um, in my practice is, you know, what are you eating? Are you moving your body? And how are you sleeping? And then yeah. people at first are like baffled, why am I talking about this as a therapist? But I'm, I'm letting them know that it's all connected. So how, how yeah. important is sleep to our lives? Definitely. Oh my God. Sleep is absolutely essential, right? Like we need to, oh, I forgot that we also need to get enough water too in terms of nutrition, but like we need food, water, sleep, right? Like those are some of the, the main things that we need. And um, sleep has, that has also been shown, like they've actually done studies where they deprived people of sleep. Um, and by deprived, I mean, they were still sleeping five hours a night. And I know plenty of people who don't even get that much sleep. Right. (laughs) And and I think, again, we have this like hashtag no sleep culture um, (laughs) thing going on and that's not helping. I cringe when I see it. I cringe. Me too. I'm like, no, hashtag sleep, hashtag sleep. (laughs) But yeah, it's, it's absolutely essential. And they found that that can alter your gut microbiome. Um, but what is, what I do want to mention, so I I mentioned how these things can negatively alter your gut microbiome, but I do want to mention that like changing your diet 
like just eating more whole foods within 24 hours can help alter your gut microbiome in a in a positive way so it really doesn't take that long to start making a switch it's not like you know of course you're not gonna feel amazing right after but that's how quickly your body can adjust so so that's the beautiful thing about it but going back to the sleep one thing that i do like to let people know about is that the prime restoration time especially for our gut or our digestive system is between 10 p.m and 12 a.m because that's the time where our melatonin level should be at its highest and therefore when our melatonin because our melatonin is also very supportive of our gut health when our melatonin level is at the highest it can help with restoration of our gut so if we're not sleeping by midnight we're i mean sleep is still sleep and you still want to get enough sleep but it's affecting it still could be affecting our digestion so i've had people who would get nine ten hours of sleep and they like you know they're they're sleeping fine but their gut is still out of balance and we just kind of shift it i'm like all right go to bed a little earlier yeah. and um and and just that simple shift can make a difference that's really incredible it's the little things that we don't know about it is yeah and so and i do want to mention like i want to give people tools right so like if you're not sleeping well then what what can you do and there's something i like to call sleep hygiene um which is kind of you know we have our hygiene uh, for for our bodies and our um ourselves but there's also sleep hygiene where we make sure that we're turning off all our electronics before we go to bed these you know, these devices are amazing and have you know, clearly keep us connected, which is awesome. But they also emit electromagnetic frequency, which can also, um, which there, it's theorized, we, we don't have like a solid proof of this, but it can potentially be lowering melatonin production. And so, um, so avoiding that um, or using blue light blockers, like when you watch TV in the evening, but also not watching TV too late into the evening, right? Um, avoiding all of those things. And then um, if you're having multiple thoughts, I mean, I honestly just recommend journaling for everyone because I think it's super helpful. I'm sure you, <laughs> you can attest to that. Um, but yeah, journaling is great. So yeah, the sleep hygiene for my listeners is something to really think about. Um, I think, you know, obviously everyone knows hygiene more so for physically physical and taking a shower. And it's something right. that is kind of second nature for us, you know, as adults, we know how to take a shower and that we need a shower and wash, so our, I kind hands. Of want to wash our hands. Right. And so I want you to take that same mentality when it comes to your sleep. And so this is something you have, I'm still screaming at my kids to take a shower. You know, they're still kids, so they don't care about their hygiene. But the more I talk about it, eventually they're going to, it's going to be second nature for them. They're going to realize they stink and they need to take a shower. And so, you know, you know, your sleep is off. So really think about, you know, what can I intentionally do? You know, I, to put the phone down, make sure the TV's off. Maybe I need to write out what I need to do for tomorrow. I'm worried about tomorrow. Let me write it out. And so really start to give yourself a routine. Our brain loves structure. And if you don't yeah. have structure for it for the nighttime, it's just going to be out of whack. Completely, completely. Yeah. One of the things I say is beds are beds are only for sex and sleep. And that's it. <laughs> <laughs> laying around watching tv all day yeah exactly don't bring your work to bed don't you know don't watch right. tv on bed um just like they're for sex and sleep and that's it <laughs> grab a chair and put it next to your bed so you can watch the tv um, yeah exactly uh miss p love is asking my says my grandmother suffers from big how do you say that varicose veins varicose veins uh what do you recommend for them yeah, so varicose veins, um, you know, I well, first, I want to make the disclaimer that I am not giving any medical advice right now. Um, everything I'm talking about today is really meant for educational purposes only. Um, so you're talking in general. Yes, in general. Um, so, so again, this, this can be almost everything that I talk about, every condition, I'm always going to start with the foundation. So we want to check if the foundations are pl in place because varicose veins can op happen when there's issues with circu circulation. So why are there issues with circulation? Um, is she having high blood pressure or high cholesterol? Is there a lack of movement, um, which is causing that so it, it kind of depends on where that's coming from, but those would be kind of the foundations again to where where to start from, especially the movement piece, I feel like has has 
really made a difference um, from those that I know who are suffering from varicose veins. But then also I've seen like runners, like marathon runners experience var varicose veins because they're actually running too much. So again, the balance of everything, right? They're, they're just running too often. And we see, you know, these athletes um, who focus on doing one specific sort of style of exercise, we see them have a lot of issues with different parts of their body, depending on what, what they're doing. And, and that's because it's too much of one thing. And, and that can always uh, also be a problem. So, so thank you. You've, you've shared a lot. Uh, I do want to ask you about 2020 March happens. You're in private, you're in, you're already doing um, Mahan health at this point, right? And mm -hmm. uh, what did you notice, you know, in your practice, uh, the shift in the things that people are struggling with and how, what have you recommended for that shift? Yeah. So um, it's been a huge shift, right? Like it's been, it's been a crazy whirlwind of a year and um, it is, it's been fascinating. So one of the questions I ask every single one of my patients is, or two, two of the questions I ask, what are your stressors and what are your stress relievers? And so after that point, pretty much everyone I'm pretty sure every single patient of mine had the stressor of COVID, right? Um, whether it was the fear of it or the the lack of community, the lack of feeling connected um, because we had become disconnected. I mean, we're literally supposed to be socially distancing, right? And so it's so it it was a very intense period. And then the lack of control, I think, um, are usually kind of the, the biggest things because a lot of, I mean, we, we tend to like be able to control so much of our lives. And, um, one of the things that I did notice in a positive light was those, in, including myself, I, I, I think I realized, um, because I usually have a lot of control over things in my life too. And when, as soon as I was able to be like, well, I have no idea what's going to happen and I have no control over it and I'm just going to go with the flow. That was the moment where my personal anxiety started to subside and I was like, all right, I'll just go with it. And, and it's kind of, it's actually been liberating in a way because I've been able to practice that throughout this period. And, um, but yeah, those are kind of the main things. And, and that those are conversations that I had with all my patients is, is the ability and working with going with the flow um, and, and trying to, so I, I also recommend doing like a gratitude journal quite often. Again, this can positively affect our gut health or any aspect of our health in general. Um, and one of the things that I recommend is every single day, write three unique things you're grateful for. And so don't write the same things, you know, like, okay, yeah, it's great to be grateful for your family, friends, you know, food, like, it's great. Like, we should be grateful for those things. But we got to we got to kind of change it up. Let's be creative with it. What else are you grateful for? Um, you know, like, I'm grateful for my laptop for having this ability or the Wi Fi for this connection that we can have this conversation you know, just the ability to, to, to connect with my thoughts and, and, you know, go inward um, mm -hmm. with myself and like, whatever those things are, just like starting to be grateful for random things helps you realize how great your life actually is, mm -hmm. which, you know, of course we go through things. Of course there are things that, you know, it's harder to be grateful on some days, you know, it definitely is, but the more we practice it, the more we can realize that there are so many little things and um and and that that can help us live a more fulfilled life and i think those two things of working on letting go control you know and going with the flow and then having this gratitude practice were kind of the two main things that i've uh, i've worked with on patients i love that and you know that's one of the things that has really shifted even before the pandemic it's just kind of shifted my mindset there's something physio there's a physiological change that happens when you start to look at what you're grateful for, it really kind of changes. And um, I think what you're trying to say is like, yes, there are some times where it is hard to see what you're grateful for. But if you're practicing this, if you're writing it out, there's something powerful about writing it out, um, you know, speaking it right. into existence. And I think that um, on those harder days, it, it become a, a impulsive, natural instinct for you to kind of, yes, I'm struggling, but this, right? 
It's not mm -hmm. something you will have to work really hard for because you're already doing it, even on the days that are easier to do it on. Is that fair to say? Yeah, definitely. And that's that's that preventative medicine, right? So the, yes. the more you practice it when you're feeling good, the the easier it becomes. It doesn't become easy. I'm saying it becomes a little bit easier whenever you are going through Absolutely. those trying times. Yeah. yeah. And I always talk to people about their prescription for life. And I, you know, I was like, what is that you need? Like what Celeste needs and what you need are two different needs. And yeah. I think that we can all look at what we need and look at it as a prescription, right? Because if I had diabetes, I'm taking my insulin every day, you know, but that's like me trying to survive. And I think when we think about living, you know, a lot of the methods that you talk about today allows us to live a a more um, healthier and peaceful lifestyle where we feel like we have control. Yeah, definitely. And I think that that's really my goal is like to have a more fulfilled and thriving life instead of just trying to survive through life, mm -hmm. right? Just making sure that, or not making sure, just like being able to. Mm -hmm. And um, and when you can get into that position, it's, it's just the most amazing, like euphoric feeling. Yeah. It's so good. It, even... Uh, I think, uh, you know, before, obviously before the pandemic, I've, I've gotten into this mindset and I didn't grow up thinking this way. I grew up think, don't talk about it and right. like, uh, just swallow your pain. And the more I've been able to do these things that you talk about, I found myself really thriving. Uh, and that feels really good. So we love you. I know I love everything that you said. And for people, uh, listening to this or watching this right now, um, you guys don't have to stop loving her because she does have a podcast. Uh, can you talk, talk to people a little bit about your podcast and you guys can follow it right now. You're streaming everywhere. Yes. Yeah. So I'm on like Apple podcast, Spotify, all, Google play, or I forget what the Google one is called, but yeah, I'm, I'm all over the place. The practice or the podcast is called Mahan health, which is the same as my practice. Um, uh, Mahan literally translates to great in Sanskrit and um and because i was ex able to experience mahan or great health um, my goal is to help everyone else experience that too because it's an amazing feeling and so that's what um, mahan health means and on this podcast i interview a number of different um doctors um whether nat naturopathic doctors or functional medicine doctors on a number of different topics so i actually just realized that my episode for today didn't actually post so i'll, I'll make sure to do that afterwards <laughs> but but that episode, this episode is actually very connected to what we were talking about today. And um, the episode is on your brain on food. Um, and so, yeah, it's, um, yeah, she, her book is, that's what it's, her book is called Dr. Uma Naidu and, and she's amazing too. And so, and we talk about different foods that can support your mental health too. And we talk about ways that it could support you. Um, if you have depression, anxiety, ADHD, um, insomnia, like what foods can support you there. So that definitely check that episode out. Um, and the other ones as well, but yeah, yeah that's, no, that's, that's check, the podcast. Out, check them all out. Cause yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. I've never gotten so many questions back to back and uh, I post a question, have people heard about uh, your, you know, what you do and then also about the gut brain and uh, over 70% said no. So, and in the fact that, uh, you know, I have my master's degree and I didn't learn about it until I was in private practice says a lot about mm -hmm. how much um, we are depriving ourselves, you know, of looking at things in a holistic manner when it comes to our health. Right. Yeah, definitely. And it's unfortunate, but that's why we're doing these things to help get the word out there. And, and there's like, and that's a thing, like, I, I mean, if you're dealing with certain issues that you need a little bit more help with, um, you know, I'm, we're always here to support. There's, a, there's, like I said, that website Institute of Natural Medicine is a great resource to find a naturopathic doctor near you. But um, there's also so many things that I'm like, you can do before you even see me and see if like that will help your health and and if that's still not enough then you can come see me and we could talk about other things but like there's so many things that you can do before you even see me and and that's the beauty of naturopathic medicine or any of these indigenous medicines is we can grow it in our backyard we can you know we can talk about it and can you know and, and work on our mindset like it's all it's it's on us and so that's the beauty of it also she's on instagram yeah, name. Name. yeah. Actually, <laughs> and Facebook. You can follow yeah. her personal and her business, both Mahan Health, which means great. I didn't tell you guys that yet, but now you know, which is great. 
We learned a new language today. <laughs> Go ahead. Actually, I have a thought on that. Okay. Okay. Well, when you said that you learned a new word, it just reminded me of something that I actually feel very passionately about is the words that we say and think to ourselves in a like you you know this as a therapist, right? Like this affects our mindset. But one of the things, again, I, I get really into history. One of the things I've realized is, so I speak two other languages, Gujarati and Hindi, and I can kind of understand Spanish to a, enough of a degree. I can, and what I realized is that the English language has a lot of issues in itself, right? Um, really? I, I mean, I won't get into all of it right now, but one of the main things that I do have qualms with is that we embody our emotions in the English language. So in so what we always say is, I am sad, I am depressed, I am angry, right? Whereas every other language that I know and that I've Google translated because I got obsessed with this idea one day, <laughs> um, every other language will say, I feel. You say, I feel oh my God, sad. Seriously? Yes. Yeah, isn't wow. that crazy? That is Isn't that crazy? And that's what I want to, I, I want to make sure everyone realizes it's okay to feel, right? It's okay to feel sad, depressed, angry, frustrated, anxious. Like it's okay to feel whatever you feel. But as long as we're not embodying that and make telling our bodies and our mind that that's permanent. When we say I am, that makes it permanent. When we say I feel, it makes it temporary. So just being mindful of the words that we then think and say. So I will do this all the time where, you know, one of the feelings that I feel like I, I tend to feel most often is exhausted or tired. And I'll be like, oh, I'm so tired. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm not tired. I feel tired. Like wow. that's not who I am. And one of the simplest examples I like to give is like um, in Spanish, most people know tengo hambre means I have hunger. Mm -hmm. And it literally means I have hunger, not I am hungry. Mm -hmm. And if you think about saying I am hungry, that doesn't make sense because that's not who we are. Like we're not hungry. We that's feel true. hungry, right? <laughs> yeah, so. Wow, that is amazing. I've never heard of that in my life. And yeah. one of the things I always do when people, it's I check in like, you know, how are you feeling today? Like I did to you when you came on. I, you know, I said, how are you feeling today? And uh, and I will say like, and, and why are you feeling it? I'm feeling blah, 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 because so that we are not like embodying it, but I never thought about that I am factor. Wow, that's pretty incredible. Right, yeah. When I had that realization, I was like, oh my God. And then yeah. I like, I, I, what? You have to tell everybody. You have yeah. to tell everybody to make contact with. I do. I'm like, I have to tell everyone this. This is crazy. I mean, and like I said, there's so much more to the English language. And the more I keep learning about it, I'm like, oh, dear. Like, there's so <laughs> many more problems, but I won't get into it all today. <laughs> uh, the last thing I wanted you to just bring up, because I do live in Boston, Mass, and uh, we are experiencing the winter months is vitamin D. Uh, tell people a little bit about vitamin D, because this is a uh, some people lack and don't even understand the correlation to their. Yes. Yes. Oh my God. Vitamin D is absolutely essential. And today I will say most of us do need to be supplementing, um, regardless of the season, but definitely, um, more so in the winter, because the reality is, um, we are not spending as much time in the sun as our ancestors were not even close. Uh, you know, if we spend an hour a day in the sun, that's nothing compared to the eight hours a day, especially people of color. Um, that's that's definitely something that I'm like, okay, people of color also, and that actually that brings up a good point, people of color also need higher levels of vitamin D um, than wow. people of Caucasian descent. Because so so the way in evolutionary biology, the, the way that we've um, evolved, right? Like I said, we originated from Africa and from that origin, we didn't need as much, um, I mean, no, we, we were getting a lot more sunlight. So if we overdosed on that vitamin D, that would have affected us negatively, which because overdosing with vitamin D is also a problem um, and can lead to like kidney issues and all sorts of different things. So be very mindful of how much vitamin D you're doing. Um, but so, so that could have been a problem. But as people moved to the you know the colder climates and essentially got the lighter skin the the white skin that then they needed to be able to absorb it much quicker and so they actually didn't need as much exposure to it because they weren't getting as much of the exposure mm -hmm. and so 
it's continued to stay that way. Um, and so that's what we see is that optimal levels for people of Caucasian descent versus people of color are different. And um, again, these are conversations that I think most practitioners don't even have, but I think it's important. Um, because, and then I also look at vitamin D at a different level. So the normal ranges are from 30 to 100, but, and then optimal levels for people of Caucasian descent are 60 to 80 and people of color, I usually say 80 to 100 um, for optimal levels. I will say when I first tested for vitamin D, when I first started naturopathic medical school, I was at seven. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it was really bad. And that can lead to inflammation. It can suppress your immune system. Um, vitamin D is the precursor for a lot of our hormones. So I had a lot of hormonal issues and that was like probably contributing to that. And those, um, hormones are precursors to our neurotransmitters. And so then therefore it can affect our mood. So we want to make sure we're getting adequate levels of vitamin D at all times. And today with, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic, what we found is over 80% of people with the symptoms of COVID-19 and those who were hospitalized actually had vitamin D deficiency. And so, um, so just right now I'm, I'm like, I wish the government, like, you know, there's, I have, you know, I know, opinions and thoughts about these things. And I'm like, it, the vitamin D is super cheap. And so I'm like, if like the government would just like, like, you know, distribute that to all populations, just some vitamin D, um, oh to, well. right. Like we could prevent so many, so many deaths right now. And so, uh, unfortunately that's not the way our system is set up though. And um, we're not in that system, but yeah, I was a walking zombie for sure. <laughs> Uh, and these, just for clarification, uh, these are not uh, labs that are happening on our physical or are they? Or is it-, it depends. I think now um, more doctors are starting to add vitamin D, uh, but I definitely recommend asking your doctor to put on a vitamin D um, because I didn't even know I was at such a low level. And um, I know when I checked my mom's and pretty much everyone I know is is not getting enough, especially if they're someone of color. Um, and, and their levels are just generally lower anyway. And so, um, so yeah, I definitely recommend adding that on to your physical, um, just, ask. I mean, usually they will, usually most primary care providers will like, cause, cause people are starting to realize like all the, the importance of vitamin D. Oh, that was a lot. <laughs> so much. <laughs> I never took a deep breath after a, a podcast, but I just like feel like I, I'm, I was taking like so much notes. I'm like, man, this is so good. This is so good. This is so good. You, you oh, are man. amazing. And the way that you're able to uh, share the knowledge to us, you make it in such layman terms that it's digestible. Like all I know now is I want to fight off the bad guys. So I want to do everything I can. Your analogy was so helpful. Oh, good. I'm glad. I actually, I do think about that all the time. I'm like, I'm nourishing my body. I'm feeding good guys. Like, look at me. I'm awesome. Like, you know, <laughs> these conversations with myself all the time. Oh my gosh. Well, thank you. Is there anything else you want to say before you go? I don't think, I don't think so. Yeah. I, I think we covered a lot. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and well, I guess one, one last thing I do want to say that, you know, I mentioned a lot, but I think the most important thing is to give yourself grace throughout that process, right? Like I talked about a lot of different things, um, figure out which of the things that I talked about, you can start to incorporate now um, and, and leave the others for, for another time, right? Don't, don't over overwhelm yourself with, with any of this, just find what resonates with you and go with that and give yourself grace. Thank you. I appreciate you so much. (laughs) Thank you. I appreciate you having me. This was super fun. That was an amazing episode. Make sure you give her a follow. She is on Facebook, Instagram. Check out her website. She does do telemedicine. A really good way to shift the way you think when it comes to your health. Also, don't forget, we have a Shifting the Way You Think community, and it's a three-month class. Enrollment only happens four times a year. Uh, The class does require a three-month commitment, so the next time the class starts is in January, April, July, or September. Uh, The enrollment closes a day before the first of the month, and this membership has currently two different classes. The first class is Healing the Inner Child, and in this class, you'll learn how to work on deep-rooted suffering learn about your inner child, why we tend to avoid the inner child, and how to identify and change 
those unhealthy coping patterns and how to accept life as it is and create peace in your life. So that's the first class. I'm also adding another class. So these are two separate classes. This class is all about love. The word love is most often defined as a noun, yet we would all love better if we used it as a verb. In this class, you will learn radical new ways to think about love by showing its interconnectedness in our private and public life. And one of the things about love is I realize so many people do not understand it, but we seek it, we yearn for it, and it really kind of starts with us. So definitely go to shiftingthewayyouthink.com to learn more about both of these classes and sign up for the class. Again, it's only offered four times a year. So the next class starts in January. It is a three-month commitment. So if you do miss that class, uh, the next class does not start until April. Until next time, beautiful people, I will talk to you later. Maybe I'm getting too emotional. Maybe. That's exactly what they say you ain't supposed to do. Suppress your feelings, never talk about your pain. Can't appreciate the sun without acknowledging it rains, right? That's right. So this is a moment of clarity. And make sure you always protect your energy. You stay focused and your life goes